Um, the end diastolic volume. If you put more blood into the heart, you can get more out. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. If there's more, if there's uh, more blood left in, that means you didn't pump blood out. If there's less blood left in, it's more to come out. So it works backwards. Yeah. So we say that the end systolic volume is indirectly related. Because if ESV is big, that meant stroke volume must be small. The amount of blood that's left in. Oh, yeah. Right? If ESV is small, that means a lot of the blood got pumped out. With end diastolic volume, the more blood that's here, the more you can pump out. The more blood that you started with, the more you have to come back. So we say in diastolic volume is directly related to stroke volume. You make it go up, stroke volume goes And systolic volume is indirect, it's opposite, it's bass backwards. So stroke volume, basically, if you alter EDV and ESV, you affect stroke volume. The three things that work together to alter these two things are preload, contractility, and activity. Three things that, that basically influence the EDV and the ESV. How much blood you put in there and how much blood's left. Okay. Preload, contractility, and afterload. Preload is basically how much the ventricles are stretched before they contract. Just like you said, remember when we talked about skeletal muscle cells, we said there was an optimum level of stretching, an optimum um, amount of overlap. So just the same thing with the heart. If you stretch it the right amount, then up to a point. Now you can't overstretch it, just like you can't overstretch your skeletal muscle. But the, the more you stretch, you get that optimal level of overlap, and so you're gonna get more force produced. Make sense? Now, how do you stretch a ventricle? Put more blood in it. Right? So that's pretty long. Contractility, of course, we've been talking about it. That's just the force that's produced. Afterload is how much force has to be generated before blood leaves the ventricle. Remember that we said when the ventricle begins to contract, the first thing that happens is the AV valve shut. Okay. And then as it continues to contract, pressure increases enough to open the semilunar valve. So the higher the pressure is in that aorta, the more force has to be generated to get the blood to go out. That's essentially the afterload. How much pressure the ventricle has to come, overcome in order to eject the blood. If you increase preload, again, up to, you know, you can't just keep increasing it infinitely, but up within normal body parameters, normal heart parameters. If you increase preload and you increase contractility, you're going to increase stroke volume. But if afterload increases, afterload is opposing the blood ejecting from the heart, right? So if afterload increases, stroke volume decreases. So these two things are directly related to stroke volume. These go up, stroke volume goes up. This is indirect. Afterload increases, stroke volume goes down. The heart is having to work harder to pump the same amount of blood. Hypertension increases afterload. The pressure in the aorta is already high. The left ventricle is having to work harder to get the same amount of blood, the same amount of stroke volume out of the heart. Now, <clears throat> so preload is basically how much that the atria is stretched. Well, how do you stretch the atria? You stretch the atria by putting more blood into the atria. That's how you stretch the right atria. And so you do this by uh, controlling venous return, how much blood is going back to the heart. And then as well as the filling time, which is the time that it takes for the blood to go into the ventricles. And so if your um, venous return goes up, your preload goes up. More blood is going back to the right side of the heart. The, the, the wall of the right atrium. Because, and the reason the right atrium is important is because that's where the SA node is. And stretching that out right atrium is going to stimulate the SA node to be faster. So specifically, even if it's the blood flow during ventricle diastole, well, that's true, but it's going to the atrium first. That's the deal. Okay. All right. So 
if the venous return increases, the heart rate increases because as the blood goes into that right atrium, it stretches the wall of the right atrium, which is where that SA number is right at the top. Think about the superior vena cava, which is the right atrium, the inferior vena cava. Sinus force is coming out from around the back side of the heart. And then you've got the right ventricle underneath. And so you've got blood flowing here, here, here. The SA node is right up here. And so as more blood falls back, the atrium stretches that stimulates the cells of the SA node to depolarize more quickly. Because you got to think about this. The more blood that's coming back to the heart, the more you've got to pump out. Now, filling time is how long the ventricle, how long you're allowing the ventricle to stay relaxed so that blood flows in there. And of course, the longer it stays relaxed, the more blood is going to flow in there. Make sense? Now, the problem is, the faster your heart is beating, the less time it has to fill. And so we talk about maxing out your heart rate. You can't, it's not, you can't just keep going up to infinity on this. At some point your heart is beating so fast that it's actually pumping less blood each time because the fill time is shorter. Does that make sense? So the faster the heart beats, the more beats per minute, the fewer milliseconds you have for the ventricles to fill. The main brief reflex is what I was talking about with the SA node. The more blood entering the right atrium, the more the walls are stretched, the SA node is stimulated, heart rate increases. And then Frank Starling, Frank Starling said that the more the heart fills with blood during diastole, the more this is stretched and the greater the force of contraction. But if you put the two things together, basically, the more blood in, the more blood out. The more blood in, the faster the heart beats. Um, the more blood in, the stronger the heart beats. All right, now, contractility. We really already talked about this. We're just looking at it from the stroke volume side as opposed to the heart rate side. All right, now, contractility and anything that stimulates or increases the force of contraction is called a positive enotrope. And these work by increasing the amount of calcium that goes in. Remember that cardiac muscles contract using the same mechanism as skeletal muscles. The calcium binds to troponin, tropomycin moves, yada, yada, yada. And so the more calcium you can go, that you can get to go into the cell, the more active sites are going to be exposed and the more cross bridges are going to be formed. Your body generates positive endotropes. Your body doesn't make negative endotropes, but some of the, the drugs that we use to treat cardiac arrhythmias are negative endotropes. Now, negative endotropes, makes the heart beat not as strongly, they can work by two ways. They can block the calcium entry or they can depress the metabolism so that less energy is generated. Less ATP. Of course, you don't have ATP, you're not going to be able to generate as much force. So, um, what happens is the epinephrine and norepinephrine, we already know that those hormones are released by the sympathetic autonomic nervous system, or those neurotransmitters, excuse me, are released by the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. So, we know they speed heart up, they speed contractility um, by basically binding these alpha and beta receptors, increasing calcium going into the cells. They also basically stimulate the, the metabolic rate of the heart muscle cells, so more ATP is generated. The parasympathetic autonomic nervous system, remember that the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system mainly innervates the top part of the heart. Not so much the, the ventricles. Sympathetic innervates pretty much all the heart. So parasympathetic, its main effect is going to be on slowing the heart down. The release of the acetylcholine slows the heart down. The, uh, the only time you really get decreased contraction is if you have a huge amount of parasympathetic stimulation. So basically, for the most part, your heart has a basic level or a baseline level of contractility and you can make it go stronger. So, um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, the T3 and T4, as well as glucagon. 
Glucagon is one of the hormones that raises blood sugar. Glucagon is what we call the, an, the uh, antagonist of insulin. They work opposite. If your blood sugar begins to drop, the pancreas, the alpha cells of the pancreas release glucagon, and the liver begins to break down glycogen, releasing glucose in our bloodstream. And so that, of course, basically is feeding the heart so it can make more ATP. Now, again, your body doesn't really produce negative inotropic agents. Your body doesn't make things to weaken the heart. But if the heart is somebody that's in congestive heart failure, the heart is, uh, they're basically trying to extend the life of the heart. And so they can give things like beta blockers and um, calcium channel blockers. Remember, the whole thing is what? Right, the endiastolic volume. The part that leaves is the? Yeah. the stroke volume. Well, the stroke volume leaves and what's left is the? Yeah. So, <coughs> that up there says that the contractility is indirectly related to the ESC, which means the harder the ventricle contracts, the less blood's going to be left in it. And the more blood that's going to leave. That's what this is. All right, last but not least is um, afterload. And remember, if you increase preload and you increase contractility, you increase stroke volume. That's the bottom line. Afterload is the only thing that causes, that is inversely proportional to stroke volume. If you increase the afterload, the heart is having to work harder to pump the same amount of blood out. If afterload increases, the amount of blood that leaves decreases. Now, under normal, healthy conditions, your afterload doesn't change. But in things like if you have hypertension, if your systolic pressure, systolic pressure is normally 120, or blood pressure is normal, 100, normally 120 over 80, right? 120 over 80. So normally that's a systolic pressure. Diastolic pressure is normally 80. So you think about the ventricles relaxed. Um, blood is in the aorta, but the ventricle's not contracting, so the pressure in the aorta should be diastolic pressure, right? Everybody follow me on that? So if this number gets high, if your diastolic pressure gets up to 100, let's say you're now 160 over 100. Remember, they always worry about, or they mainly worry about that number, right? This is why, because as that diastolic blood pressure increases, that's increasing the afterload, which means the heart is having to work harder to pump the same amount of blood out each time as opposed to if this was 80. Does that make sense? So let's say, what's what's the normal stroke, average stroke volume? 70, 70 mils, right? So let's say during a regular contraction, this is 80, and so stroke volume, <laughs> 70 mils comes up. If this goes up to 100, Maybe only 50 mils. Well, I'm just pulling these numbers out of the orifice in my choice. And so, if afterload increases, stroke volume decreases. Now, what happens is the heart does contract stronger in order to keep the same. And what's happening, particularly in the left side of the heart, if you overwork those ventricles, they get weaker. If the heart is having to work too hard, Whereas if you overwork your skeletal muscles, they get stronger. If you if you overwork the heart, and of course now when you when you do cardiovascular exercise, you're you're working the heart as it should within its normal parameters. But when you have when the heart has to start doing this, you're, it's being pushed too hard, and that left what happens is the heart enlarges, and the, the force of contraction decrease, and you go into basically eventually congestive heart failure. All right, now here's one of the coolest things. The concept of cardiac reserve. Even lazy me, my heart can, well, we'll go with four. I have a cardiac reserve. In other words, if I have to run up the steps, my heart can work harder than its baseline. It can increase its cardiac output enough to deal with uh, physical exertion. I have cardiac reserve. 
Olympic athletes, they can actually basically um, increase their cardiac output by seven to eight times because their hearts are finely tuned. They're, they're in shape. They're very efficient. Does that make sense? So not at rest. Just not at rest. We're talking, you know, if we think about your cardiac output at rest, you know, five liters of blood every 60 seconds, right? And we said if the heart beats faster, then in moderate exercise, it doubles every 30 seconds it goes through. In intense exercise, every 15 seconds it goes through. Okay. So how many times your heart can um, double its cardiac output, increase its cardiac output, that's your cardiac reserve. At maximum, say like um, if I'm exercising, if I'm running up and down the steps, my heart can be pumping my entire volume of blood through my body about every 15 seconds. Right? Okay, so that would be four times my resting cardiac output. Okay, that would be my cardiac reserve. Athletes can even, you know, the best athletes would be twice that. They could do it eight times. So that'd be like every, what's 60 divided by eight? Well, 15 divided by two would be five. So, so thank you, there we go, it works for me. <laughs> 7 .5. So their entire volume of blood is going through their bodies every 7.5 seconds. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? Okay. Now, people that have heart disease, heart failure, they don't have any cardiac reserve. Basically, just breathing and sitting on the couch watching TV and riding that stupid scooter at Walmart. They have, their heart is just strong enough to pump blood so they can survive. They don't have the strength to walk from the car into the store. Their heart can't increase its cardiac output. They basically have no cardiac reserve. 